It now gave me great pleasure to welcome the 17th president of MIT, Raphael Reif, who will speak to us first and then introduce our keynote speaker. Sergio, let me, let me see if it worked for me. Good morning. Good morning. That was awesome. <laughs> Thank you, Lulu, for, for your nice introduction. And many thanks to uh, everyone who helped to bring us together this morning, including our host, the Committee on Race and Diversity, the MLK Planning Committee, and our Institute Community and Equity Officer, Ed Birchinger. And above all, a huge thank you to our student speakers, our incredible student speakers, Itoro and Sergio. You make us all so proud. Thank you. <laughs> this, morning, this morning, we come together to celebrate in the spirit of Dr. King, the value of activism, especially student activism, in driving social change. So I begin by congratulating all the winners of this year's MLK Leadership Award. I recognize that the staff and faculty who work on these issues play a profound role in our community. But in the context of today's event, I offer special recognition to the student winners, Rashid August of the Black Student Union, the Black Graduate Student Association, George Chow, an activist for graduate student concerns and fossil-free MIT. In terms of student activism on our campus, this has been quite a year, an extraordinary year. On topics from race, inclusion and social justice to climate change, our students have in many ways become our teachers. That has been true on campuses across the country. But our students have done things differently in a way that I particularly admire. I want to share just one example, an image that I will never forget. I chair a group at MIT called Academic Council. It was referred to it earlier this morning. About 30 of MIT's top academic and administrative leaders we met, we meet Tuesday mornings. One Tuesday in January, for the first time that I can remember, a group of students were invited and came to our meeting. The leaders of the BSU and the BGSA presented their ideas for making the MIT community more diverse and more welcoming for all. Many of you know these students, I'm telling you. They were magnificent. They were thoughtful. They were creative, persistent, specific, collaborative, constructive, and serious. They went out of their way to incorporate the views of students from other underrepresented groups as well. And with Academic Council, they set the tone of mutual respect and they earned tremendous respect in return. The students brought their recommendations to address issues specific to MIT today, improving orientation and adding booster shots of inclusion education after freshman year, enhancing financial aid, collecting and publishing new types of data about the student experience, hiring more diverse mental health staff, providing training to overcome unconscious bias, and the list goes on. Today, these students are collaborating with Academic Council's brand new working group on inclusion. Together, they are addressing these recommendations and the problems they aim to solve. The working group will share a public progress report in time for spring break. And I'm confident, I'm confident that we are on a path to sustained and meaningful change. You may find interesting to know that Academic Council has volunteered to be the pilot group 
for unconscious bias training. For this exceptional example of student activism, of initiative and constructive leadership, I'd like to publicly say here to them, thank you and bravo. As one of our student leaders put it recently, it is wonderful to see the gears of MIT go to work on a problem. And I could not agree more. One last observation. When these students spoke to Academic Council, they made it clear that some of what needs to happen has to do with human values. They are asking us to say out loud that we value the diversity of our community. I do. They are urging all of us at the MIT to maintain a human perspective and to remind each other that while the quality of our students' work is important, their mental and physical health is most important. I agree. And finally, they're making a powerful case that a more welcoming, more inclusive MIT would be better for absolutely everyone. They are right. And I look forward to working with them to make this vision real. And now I'm honored to introduce this morning's keynote speaker. Freeman Habrowski is president of the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. He has held that job for 24 years. Now, I've been president here for three and a half years. <laughs> I must tell you, Freeman's record will be tough, if not impossible, to beat. But I take comfort, I take comfort in the knowledge that he had a tremendous head start over me. <laughs> he was born eight days before me. <laughs> <laughs> As many of you know, through his leadership of UMBC, Freeman has accomplished something deeply important. At MIT, some of the work we admire most comes at the intersection of theory and practice, when a powerful idea translates into effective solutions in the real world. President Habrowski has become the leading theorist and the most accomplished practitioner of the science of empowering students of color and women to succeed at the highest levels in STEM fields. UMBC is a predominantly white institution. By living up to his vision, by living up his vision, it has become a national leader in the number of its minority graduates who go on to earn doctorates, doctorates in medicine, in the sciences, and in engineering. What's more, his efforts have become models for colleges and universities across the country. For example, in 1988, Freeman helped launch UMBC's widely recognized Meyerhoff Scholar Program for young black men interested in science and engineering. The program provides each scholar with academic support, as well as personal advising and mentoring year round through the first two years of college. Their success rates are through the roof and a very high percentage of them go on to graduate school in STEM fields. At MIT, we were so impressed that four years ago, we adopted key features of the Meyerhoff model for a program we call Interface Edge. It serves about 70 MIT undergraduates a year, and the first Interface Edge cohort will graduate this June. And we have Freeman to thank for the model and for the inspiration. Freeman has also co-authored three books on how to help young people succeed. And he has won a great many honors. In 2009, Time Magazine named him one of America's best college presidents. Three years later, they declared him one of 100 most influential people in the world. And in 2012, President Obama asked him to chair the newly created 
President's Advisory Commission on Educational Excellence for African Americans. Freeman's awards and achievements are remarkable, but I would like to mention just one more. In 2015, US News and World Report named UMBC one of the most innovative national universities. MIT made that list too. <laughs> in fact, our two institutions came in third and fourth. Never mind which one was which. <laughs> but, but, number one was Arizona State. Number two was Stanford. So I'm planning to strike a deal with Freeman for us to stick together and earn the two top spots next time. Right. In short, in short, as our diverse community seeks a path that combines the highest level of intellectual achievement with a warm sense of welcome and inclusion for all, we could not ask for a better guide and friend than this morning's speaker. Please welcome President Freeman Abrowski. I enjoyed hearing that we are the same age and that you were number three and we were number four. You, you had about 100 years ahead of us. You were founded <laughs> in 1861, so you, and you have quite a bit more in your endowment. So I, I think pound for pound, we're doing okay also, all right? You get that, all right, all right, all right, all right. <laughs> William Carlos Williams once said that it's difficult to find news in poetry and yet men die miserably every day because of a lack of what is found there. And so I begin with the words of our beloved and now late Maya Angelou, who looked into the eyes of this country and said, lift up your eyes upon this day breaking for you. Give birth again to the dream. Women, children, men, take it, this dream, into the palms of your hands molded into the image of your most public self, sculpted into the shape of your most private need. Here on the pulse of this new day, you may have the grace to look up and out and into your sister's eyes and into your brother's face and say simply, very simply with hope, good morning. Good morning to MIT. Good morning, give her a hand for poetry. Give her a hand for poetry. I was so impressed by these students today, I got goosebumps. And your theme is truth and power, I would have called it truth to power. As they both spoke so eloquently about the challenges we face in our society, the challenges we face on our campuses, whether it's MIT or UMBC, the fact that we can be better than we are and that students have a very important role to play in helping us look in the mirror as a nation and a society, as institutions. Give all the students in the room a round of applause. I was delighted to talk with Raphael as a fellow president, as somebody who cares deeply about these issues and who was asking me really wonderful questions about my perceptions, about my students who come here. I've got several students here today. If I have an alum who's here today, who's here at MIT or somewhere at Harvard, MIT, there's several of you here. You, are you in the room? Stand up if you are. If you're in the room, stand up and give them a round of applause wherever they are. There's several here. Yeah. Very nice. Very nice. Very proud of them, very proud of them getting ready to finish PhDs in the sciences and MD PhDs between Harvard and MIT. And we've had a number of students to come here and to do well. I dedicate this talk to two people. One is Robert Meyerhoff, who is an actually a, a graduate of, of MIT all the way back to the 40s. 
um, and uh, a wonderful philanthropist who worked with us from the beginning of our program to think about how do we help more at the time African Americans in particular to succeed in science on a campus predominantly white when I first got in there where students of color and particularly there in that Baltimore area, black kids were not doing well in science. And we started with young black males at a time when nobody wanted to talk about males of color, you see. And it was Bob Meyerhoff who said, I'm already working on some issues with my wife's alma mater, Gaucho, on women, and I want to see. He said, because everything I see on TV about black males, if it's not sports, it's about handcuffs or guns. And this was back in the late 80s. Give him a round of applause for having that kind of vision. And now we are proud to say we have students of all races. It's still heavily African-American and Hispanic, but males and females. And we lead the country not only in producing blacks who go on to get PhDs in STEM among predominantly white schools, but for any type of institution, we're number one in producing blacks who go on to get MD PhDs. Give us a big round of applause for that. And the other person I want to mention is another graduate of your institution at the undergrad level, Janice Lumpkin, the late Janice Lumpkin. And it's hard for me to talk about her because she, she graduated from here in chemical engineering and she went to the University of Pennsylvania, became the second African-American woman to get a PhD in chemical engineering. And she came to our campus and she was amazing. And she helped us to develop at my program in those years and support it. And it was the first time so many of my students, whether, and I have students from 150 countries, it was the first time most of them had ever seen an African-American woman faculty member in engineering of any kind. You get my point? So she began with that ability to say it is possible to do it. But then she brought to it such compassion and brilliance and this ability to pull people together and to say, we are better than this. We can do this. And she inspired so many of the Meyerhoffs, but so many of my white students to go on to graduate students, and particularly women. She tragically died in childbirth. But she had just gotten tenure, and we celebrate her legacy. And I want you today to think about the idea that this institution Produced both of Bob Meyerhoff, a, a wonderful philanthropist. People say, well, was Bob Meyerhoff black? I said, black? His name is Meyerhoff. They said, well, your, na well, your name is Rabowski. So <laughs> a wonderful Jewish philanthropist who simply cared about people and other people's children. And then a wonderful, brilliant young woman from Shaker Heights, Heights Ohio from Cleveland, who came here and had some people who cared about her, had some challenges, yes, yes, but who went on and got that PhD and knew the significance of giving back to others. And so I want you to think with me for the next few minutes about the story of America, about your stories, students, faculty, staff members, alumni. Each of us has a story. If I were to tell you, give you a theory, in this room you might be interested. Most audiences would not, would not be interested. In this room you might be interested. And I will tell you that if you look at my writings, you'll see a theory of social transformation, saying that our universities, predominantly white universities, I wrote it several years ago, must look in the mirror and rethink the culture of the institution. That it's not just about students changing, I saw this on my own campus. I still see it as we work on these challenges. It is about the entire institution changing, thinking about its values, its assumptions, the way it treats people, empowering people. That would be the theory I would give you. And we used it in our, I chaired, I was the PI of our advanced program when we talked about more women faculty members. We've used it with the Miles Scholars, with our Center for Women in IT. But more important for the entire institution to say all of us must be involved in this work. If we are to pull people in who've not been historically represented at the institution, we must hear their voices, we must think about who we are and who we want to become. And my essential point today, as I tell you my own story, is that the way we think about ourselves, 
as a society, as the academy, as MIT, as UMBC, the language that we use, the way we interact with each other, the values that we hold will shape who we are not only today but in the future. In other words, our dreams and our values really become who we are. And so I'm sitting in the back of church in the middle of the week as a 12-year-old, and I was always a little nerdy kid, loving math. I've always loved math. I get goosebumps still doing math. And I'm forced to be there because my parents say, we want you to hear this guy talk. And they bribe me with the two things I love most, eating and, and math. <laughs> so I'm eating M&Ms, the good kind with the peanuts, and doing my math. Now, I'm 12, but I'm, in the, I'm about to go to the 10th grade. I've skipped grades, not because I'm so smart, but because I had wonderful, wonderfully educated parents who had been working with me on word problems all my life, who had taught me to study Dostoevsky when I was in middle school, because they knew the world wouldn't be fair to a little colored child, and that I had to be twice as good and had to read broadly and study a lot. And my mama, who taught math and English, would work with my father, and they'd work with me to make me ready so that one day when I had a chance to be in class with white kids, one day I would not feel inferior. And so I'm sitting in the back of church, and I'm, I'm, I'm getting fatter and smarter all the time as I'm doing this math. <laughs> you know, the southerners, Atlanta, we like those cheeks. You know that. Uh-huh. Got to have a little padding, right? And, and the guy says, if the children participate in this peaceful protest, all of America will understand that even our babies, our children, know the difference between right and wrong. And I look up, because I'm thinking about these hand-me-down books that we have to use in our schools in our all-black schools, and my parents not allowed to buy my books because then I'd be different from other kids. So you have to use these raggedy books that came from the white schools when they finished using them after years. Awful for us to have to feel that we were so second class that we got their hand-me-down books. And so I look up and I say, who is that guy? And of course his name was Dr. Martin Luther King. And I was absolutely transformed because his message was this, that the world of tomorrow could be better than the world of today, and that I, a child, could be empowered to be a part of that transformation, that it wasn't just about what he would do or what my parents would do. He wanted me to be involved. I go home and I say, I've got to go. I've got to march in this peaceful protest. And my parents look at me and say, absolutely not. No, you cannot. <laughs> And I am so not upset, not academically perturbed. I am pissed, all right? <laughs> I am so upset. And I look at them and I said, you know, you guys made me go. I did not want to go. You told me to listen. I actually did listen. <laughs> he tells me what he wants me to do. And now you tell me I can't do it. You are hypocrites. <laughs> at that time, students, it's all right, all right, they, you did not tell your parents they were hypocrites, right? <laughs> Go to your room, boy. And for that night, I knew I was in trouble. But the next morning, they came in. It was the first time I'd ever seen my parents looking. You could tell they had been crying. And they said, it wasn't that we did not trust you. We know that if you go, you will go to jail. And we don't trust the people in jail who will be over you. But if you are determined to do this, and you've thought about it. And they said, why do you want to go? And I started. I said, how do, these hand-me-down books, right? You know, I've got some good teachers, but everybody says the white schools are better. You know, and you tell me you want me to get And we go through this argument. We talk about it. And then they finally say, we will put you in God's hands. Now, if the situation were reversed, and my kid, who's now grown, had at 12, I'm not sure I would have allowed him to go. You get my point? It's scary. And I was not a courageous kid, students. The only thing I'd ever attacked in my life was a math problem, <laughs> all right? If a fight broke out, I was running the other way, all right? Okay? Not even ashamed to admit it. But here's the point. We did go, and I did lead my little group because there were kids as young as 8 and 9 and 10. And while I was only 12, I was a high school kid. I was, I was more mature. And here's the point. We learned in that five days in jail horrible experiences. But we also learn that even children can be empowered 
to know they can make a difference. And there is my message to you, students, that yes, you do have the right and the ability to speak truth to power. Give yourselves a hand again for speaking truth to power. And so what does that mean today? What difference did it make? Well, interestingly enough, if I wrote an article and it, it was so amazing to me to realize that most of the people in this country today were not born, Raphael, in 1963. Watch this. How many of you were not even in the world in 1963, had not been born? That is disgusting. I want you to know that. <laughs> I want to tell you to get out. Just get out. <laughs> It turns out, I did, I did, two thirds of Americans were born after 1963. So the experience that you hear me talking about for most of you is like something in a book. You get my point? And I am that connection with those of my generation. Anybody who was born, at, I mean, before that time, raise your hands if you're older than that. Thank you very much for being in the room, all right? I appreciate that. You stay, all right? You stay, all right? But here's my point. But within that period of the 60s, when people spoke truth to power, people of all races spoke truth to power, we did see all kinds of changes. For example, we went through the Civil Rights Act and the Higher Education Act and the Voting Rights Act. All were passed in that period, legislation. And what difference did it make? Let me tell you that even here in Boston, in the 60s, we could not have had a room looking like this. You could not have had a woman chancellor of MIT, Cynthia, wherever she is. You get my point? For women, for people of color, it would not have been the case. And the world is different. When I ask Americans the question, what percent of Americans do you think had a college education when I went to jail in 1963? What do you think? Just spit it out. Somebody say it. What do you think? What percent of Americans had a college education, completed college? This would be MIT knowing that, wouldn't you? Uh -huh. <laughs> Absolutely right. It was only 10%. What percent of whites? I'm hearing 30 and 70. Now, you're supposed to know some math. Now, 10% of the whole group, the majority of folks were white, right? <laughs> Come on, math people in the room, right? It was only 11%. And for blacks? Don't be embarrassed to say it. That's what he told, told us. He said, say the truth. Say whatever it is, right? <laughs> say it. It was only 2 to 3%, right? Right? And we were not even counting other groups then. So, Gerald, we, had, we were talking black and white in the 60s. In fact, watch this. How many of you in this room remember something called black and white TV? <laughs> the older people. And how many students in here have always had color TV? That's disgusting. It really is. <laughs> But I mean, today, though, we go to all the different groups in our society. So what percent have a college degree today? Mm -hmm. It's just about 30 percent, 31 percent. What percent of whites? It's up to about 37 percent. What percent of Latinos and Hispanics, the fastest growing in our country? It's just at 15 percent. What percent of blacks? It's about 20%. What percent of Asians? It's at 55%. But there are certain groups of Asian Americans where that's not the case. It's very important when talking about diversity to go to specificity. There's a difference between my black students whose parents are from the islands and those whose black care parents are from South Carolina or those who are from Nigeria. There are differences in, in the Hispanic population. My kids who are from Puerto Rico, who are from New York, very different from my kids from, from the University of Puerto Rico. You get my point? There are different challenges, depending on where you're from. But the point is, you put it all together, and we can tell you that, that literally over two-thirds of Americans over 25 today did not go to college, have not graduated from college. Why is that important? Well, all of my friends, white, black, Hispanic, whatever, Asian, will say Native Americans' numbers are below everybody. You know that. We've got to keep working on that issue. But here's the point. All of my friends will say, Freeman, that couldn't be true. Everybody I know went to college. Duh. <laughs> Do you get it? Duh. MIT professors know MIT professors. <laughs> grad students know grad students, right? Right? Lawyers know lawyers. Doctors, no doctors, and plumbers who make more money than any of you all, no plumbers, all right? <laughs> the point is that literally we've gone from 10% to 30%, and every group has gotten better off as a result of that. But here is the challenge. The bottom quarter of our country, of the population of every race, the bottom quarter 
of the students of every race have a probability of graduating from a four-year institution that's under 10%. I don't care whether you're white or black or Hispanic or Asian, whatever the group, right now, until we do more in terms of intervention to help with both the academic skills in many cases of little children in Atlanta or in Baltimore or here in Boston, in terms of the academic skills on the one hand and then the issues involving financial aid because the financial aid issue for poor people is not that they can't get it from the federal government, it's that nobody's helping them to fill out the forms before the deadline. If you don't fill out the forms before the deadline, you don't get the money. And if the forms are as complicated as they are like the IRS, right? So it's the financial issues, it's the academic issue, but it's also having the dream, the vision. And so here's what I want you to think about. On the one hand, as your students were saying, it is so important that we look at our own institutions in higher education to understand why students of all backgrounds, black students and others, Hispanics and others, are saying around the country there are challenges on these campuses. We're not necessarily made to feel like we belong here, or people are making all kinds of statements and assumptions. I'll never forget when I got an A on the algebraic topology test in grad school, and the, I'm the only little black kid in the class, and the professor writes on my paper, you did surprisingly well. <laughs> now, remember I told you my mother's an English teacher. I go up and I say, why the adverb? <laughs> he didn't know what I was talking about. I, I like that, I like that. Right, right. And when I pointed to the word, surprisingly, he, all he could do was turn red. The advantage black people have is we don't turn red, all right? <laughs> <laughs> Got to put humor into this stuff. Tell the truth, but put a little humor into it. Ease it a little bit. And, and amazingly, just recently, that person sent me the message that in his old career as he retired, that I had taught him the best lesson about looking in the mirror and the assumptions we make. If you've not seen a little black kid in a topology class, you assume it can't happen. When we said at UMBC that we wanted students not only to succeed, but to be excelling, to be the very best. And when we said we want to be able to place students on the faculties of the best institutions in the country, that we wanted to produce not just MDs but MD PhDs. We wanted people to dare to know and to be at the top. People said, impossible, impossible. I'll never forget when I went to one big foundation and talked about evaluating the program, and I'll never forget them saying, Freeman, it's going to take generations before blacks will get PhDs. And the person looked at me and said, you don't have the gravitas yet in your race. He said that to me. And it was amazing. I looked at him and he said, now you're an exception, but you, you don't have the gravitas. You get my point? People always want to make the one person the exception, right? Yeah, I went through school early. Yeah, I finished my math major when I was 18 because I had had advantages and dared to know. It wasn't about being smart. It was about being blessed to have people who kept working on me and focusing on me. Anybody in here, whether you come from money or not, and many of you don't, but you had somebody in your home, somebody in a, in a school who took interest in you and made the difference. You are the most privileged human beings in the world. At an MIT, you're the most. When I came here years ago, Raphael, with, with my dear friend Mark Wrighton and talked, 20-some years ago to all the chairs, and we were talking, and it was, he was saying, these departments represent the best of their kind in the world, and it, it's inspiring. But here is what I want you to think about. As you think about being the most privileged, all of you, students, faculty, and staff, we must learn to look in the mirror at ourselves. For the students, I would say you should say what you're feeling, what you're experiencing. At the same time, know that this experience is preparing you for the next level because the more advantaged you are, the more you'll continue to be the only one wherever you go. I have always walked in and been the only one, and people have always wondered, is he really qualified? After 25 years as president, I still get that sometimes. It is what happens, right? Why am I telling you that? Yes, we want to tell the truth, but we need to decide who are we as a student? Who am I as a professor, as a president of a MIT or a UMBC? And what difference can I make? I would say to you, as the most privileged in the world, you have the capacity to solve any problem. You're solving some of the greatest science and technology problems that exist. On my own campus, we are working on STEM half, more than half my students are in STEM, students from all over the world, and I see how the intensity of students from other countries, I use that to get my students from this country to get that sense of that, that intensity. If you look 
at the Nobel laureates throughout the 20th century, so many of them came at the time in the 20th century from European countries. Their parents didn't speak English well in New York. They went to the poor man's Harvard, City College, Brooklyn College. Why did they do so well from the humanities to the science? That, in, that hunger, that intensity. We have a Chesapeake Bay Retriever on our campus, a, a dog, and we have the statue of him who is our, he's our mascot. And my basketball team reads really well, I want to tell you that. <laughs> Meaning they don't win a lot of games, but they read really well. <laughs> all right, and we're great in debating, great in chess, you know, we do all really well. Lacrosse does better, soccer does well, but they are, we, we are a nerdy place, all right? And we've got 100 companies on campus, and what we're always talking about is what makes the difference. These are companies cited by my students and by faculty. What makes the difference? It is that we call ourselves the house of grit. The Chesapeake Bay Retriever is named True Grit. And we're making the point to America, stop talking about this kid is smart and that kid is not smart. It's about how hard you work. It's about having support from people to help you pull you into the work. What makes the difference in the Maho program is that faculty on our campus, most of whom are white, most of whom are still white men, the advance has gotten me up to 39% women assistant professors, so give us a big hand for that. Big hand for that. And we've got just getting in our first people of color in these departments, but the key is that my white guys, guys get it. If you look at my new book, I put, the publishers wanted to know, why aren't you putting blacks on, blacks on the cover? I said, no, because in science, power is across races, and white guys are powerful, am I right? My best friends, right? So Mike Summers, the Howard Hughes investigator, my dear friend has produced more African Americans who've gone on to get PhDs in biochemistry than anybody in the country. And so he is there with the HIV virus there. People are thinking it's art. It's HIV because he studies that. You know, and what's amazing is I've got a young black man there, Mahoff. Then I've got one of my, uh, my mentees who's a young Korean, am, a Korean American. All of them looking at this disease and thinking this is a problem of humankind. And therein is the dream that people of all races, men and women, come to know each other well enough, trust each other well enough, work hard enough that they work to solve the problems of humankind. Give the dream a round of applause, the dream of solving the problems of humankind. And so, I want you to listen to Marketplace from yesterday. I was so pleased, it just happened to come up, um, that they've got interviews of my faculty in the morning and the evening, and it's on confronting biases in faculty hiring. And the significance to the approach we're using is, while there are people of color helping in the training, the real ambassadors and trainers are all white. Whites who are the most highly respected on my campus, who've agreed to come together to work collaboratively with faculty to help us to diversify the faculty. Give my campus a hand for having the courage to do that. That's on NPR from Marketplace from yesterday. And so I want you to think about this. Students, I want you to think about the notion, yes, you want to think about things on this campus, but you also want to think about things in this community and back in your own communities. Because I cannot say it enough, you are among the most privileged. And you want to deal with the issues here as much as you can. It takes time for some things to happen, but you want to, you know, you need the support. When, you, when you're having a hard way, you need to know and believe that a sense of self is most important. You must have a build a, build a community around yourself of people, as she said, of peers, Toro, of peers, of people who can say to you, it'll be okay. And then you want to identify faculty and staff who will give you that support, and you want to get into those offices and say, I need your help. Never keep it to yourself. If you've got problems, tell somebody. Say, I need this help, whether it's in a class or it's about emotional experiences that you're having, and ask questions in the lab, ask questions in the classroom, ask questions in your dorm, wherever you are. It was I, Robbie, the Nobel laureate, who said when he was growing up in New York, all of his friends, parents, mothers particularly, would say, what'd you learn in school today? He said, but not my Jewish mother. He said, my Jewish mother would say, Izzy, did you ask a good question today? And the practice of encouraging his curiosity made him the thinker he became. And so I challenge you, MIT, to ask the good questions, not just about science and technology, but about humankind, about the human 
condition? What will it take to have more diverse faculty? If students are not having the right experiences, are we listening to their voices, not just because they're impressive as truth tellers, but because we want to figure out the strategies with specificity that can change the environment? Because students have been asking questions on this campus and all of our campuses for at least 30, 40 years. It's been a 50-year experiment that we have been working to pull more people into this work. And my final point to you involves the notion of struggle. Anybody who loves math or science or reading T.S. Eliot understands that the most fascinating work comes when you have to dive into it. And you, I'm working, I'm reading T.S. The Wasteland for 35 years to understand. Every time I read it, layers of understanding coming from the experiences I've had. So my wife and I are just celebrated a big anniversary, and we gave ourselves a gift of going back to learn French. And, uh, and so Jacqueline, ma femme Jacqueline et moi, nous étudions le français maintenant, tous les jours. Mon professeur est un étudiant doctorant à UMBC, il est en origine de France, de Normandie. And nous avons passé du temps à Paris uh, in août pour notre anniversaire 45. Give me a big hand, 45 years, America. 45 years. But I leave you with one statement and one quote from a poem. It was Apollinaire, the poet, in one of his poems that says, La joie venait toujours après la peine. La joie venait toujours après la peine. The joy comes after the struggle. All of this is about a struggle. Anybody who's working to learn anything substantive is struggling. Anybody who's trying to change a UMBC or an MIT is struggling because it is not hard. It is not easy. The academy does not change easily for any of us. It takes effort. It 1954, the schools were desegregated. In the 60s, I still couldn't go to a school that was integrated. You get my point? It takes, we have to keep working at it. You know, in that last year before Janice Lumpkin died, when she died, I asked her, what has helped you to be the woman of courage you are? She was such a powerful presence. And she said, I remember how blessed I am to have had wonderful parents who gave me support. I remember both the professors who supported me and those who didn't think I would make it. Both inspired me. She said, and I understood that nothing takes the place of hard work and attitude. And I am determined to help my students understand that of those to whom much is given, much is required. MIT, you must do what we are doing. You are supposed to be placing the students of all races, men and women, on the faculties across this country. You're supposed to be the place that's saying, I am an MIT graduate. I believe you can do this. You have the best brains in the world of every race here. I challenge you, MIT. Be the best, not just in STEM, but for humankind. Watch your thoughts, they become your words. Watch your words, they become your actions. Watch your actions, they become your habits. Watch your habits, they become your character. Watch your character, it becomes your destiny, dreams, and values. Thank you all very much.